Welcome to Change Bible Church, where being intentional about preaching the word that builds you up, gives you wisdom, and puts you over is the order of the day. Oh my God, we thank you for sticking with us all the time and coming to our telecast. Here, the preaching, the music, and the song, it's a place of fellowship. Of course, we know during these times, times of lockdown, times of COVID, coming together around virtual services is becoming the order of the day. We're here for you. We're here to make sure to minister to you to speak to your pain, to speak to your situation, to speak to your situation. We pray that may God keep you strong as you enjoy with us the services. The music is beautiful. Please enjoy the service with us, the teaching of the word, the preaching of the word, and we love you as you enjoy the service with us. Change Bible Church. Heavenly Father, we bless your holy name. We give you all the glory, all the praise, all the honor belongs to you, O oh God. We thank you for this brand new day. We thank you for your goodness, O oh God. We declare that there is no other God like you. That only you are worthy of the praise, O oh God. Only you are worthy of the glory, O oh God. You deserve it, O oh God. We bless your name, Jesus. Hallelujah.
Father, we give you praise. We give you honor and majesty. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is circled in the heavens. We thank you that you are a fair God who judges based on his word. You love us. You care for us. You look after us. We revel in your glory, in your love and care for our lives. Thank you for looking after and taking care of us. Thank you for giving us Jesus, giving us salvation, redemption. Thank you for saving us in the name of Jesus. And for that, we give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Greetings, beloved. Thank you for coming through to our telecast. I want to take our time today. I want to hone in specifically. I want to talk about the word exaltation. But what I want to do, I want to break, up, break that word down into its four components and then take it forward and then so that we can look at practical examples in Scripture that fit in into our choice of Scripture. So we're going to take our reading. Let's pray first. Father, we... Look to you, we ask for wisdom, direction, and anointing to deliver the word. We pray that, Father, you speak to your people. Whoever is watching, may they draw it out of me, Father, to, to deliver the word in a way that will encourage them, build them up in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. So we're taking our scripture reading from Hebrews 11, verse number 25. Of course, we're taking our time. We, we look at it. I beg your pardon. Chapter 10, verse number 25. Well, the reason why I read the book of Hebrews is because historically we understand that when we look from the entire New Testament, the corpus of Scripture, the whole body of Scripture in the New Testament, from resuming from Matthew right up to the end to, to Revelations, when you look at the level and the intensity, the amount of opposition, persecution, and affliction of the church of the people of God, you find out that nothing that tops the book of Hebrews the book of Hebrews is a book that teaches us to serve God in the midst of intense adversity, intense negativity, intense pushback on the part of the devil. So where the devil thinks everything else is going to um, destroy the church completely, that's why we rise up with a high level of faith. And that is why we have the faith chapter in the book of Hebrews. Take your time and read it. You'll find that words like, let us hold fast our confession. Words like, don't throw away your confidence. Words like, Let's look to God uh, represented. So we find them in the book of Hebrews. So in the, in the, in this time when, when other people are facing difficult times, one way or the other, whether through COVID, effects of COVID-19, or as a result and job situation and anywhere any else, this is the time for us to teach faith because Paul taught faith in the book of Hebrews right in the midst of difficult times. And so therefore, if we have got an ear of scripture, we can listen to what scripture is doing, where scripture is going, in difficult times, we have to come around and teaching the things that are taught in the book of Hebrews. So that's the expressed purpose why we're focusing, we're zeroing in on the book of Hebrews because it's the thing to teach on when the devil is trying to heighten up his attack on the church or new as a child of God. So I want to look at Hebrews 10 verse 25 and then I want to start from there. In other words, it says, Do not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much more as you see the day is approaching. Of course, the basics, the fundamental of the verse says, let us not stop to get together. I know for some reason, uh, some people have not been able to physically get together. We've got regulations in the nation around how much numbers. I'm, I'm not necessarily focusing on that. But now that you and I are getting together online one way or the other, and they win, whether online or television one way or the other, where this sermon is going to land up in terms of um, um, production, in terms of where people are listening to, now, now that we're getting together, the Bible says my duty and our duty is to exhort one another. Okay, the Bible says let us exhort one another. If you look at that word exhort, it has got four component words to it. The first word, of course, um, is the word to encourage, to encourage. The second word is to comfort. The third word is to strengthen. And the fourth word is to warn. So I want to work with those four components of exhortation. So the first one is to encourage and the second, encouragement, to offer encouragement. That would be the same verb and noun word expressed differently. And the second part would be uh, to comfort and to bring comfort. That, well, comfort is when some people have lost something and then you, you encourage them to that time. But if I sin completely, when you comfort people, maybe someone has lost a member of the family, you can't just comfort them. You've got to comfort them and strengthen them, comfort them and encourage them and make sure they get up and face life uh, even though they've lost a loved one. And of course, to those that have lost a loved one, our heart goes out to you. 
uh, we understand your pain. We may God strengthen you. I hope you be strengthened and encouraged and be comforted by the someone that we're offering today. Okay. So those are four words or four components, if you would, that I want to work with around the word exhortation. Number one is encouragement. Okay. So number one, so the opposite of that is it would be discouragement. Of course, if you look at encouragement closely, which is what I want to work with very, very, very um, broadly of the four words. Okay. And um, yeah, so if you look at the negative of that or the opposite of that is discouragement. Okay. So we can put it like this. Who needs encouragement? Who, who are the people who, are, who need encouragement? Let me give you a list of people who need encouragement or who may need encouragement. Number one is people who have been, de- who, who have been dealt a blow by life. You know, a life has dealt you a blow. Maybe you've lost something or the, the, the most thing, or one of the things you never thought would ever happen to you has happened to you. Life has dealt with a blow. Number two, people have been discouraged. Number three, people have lost things. They need encouragement. People have been disappointed. They need encouragement. People have lost the fire of serving God, the passion of serving God. They need to be encouraged to be brought back. That's, what, that's when we bring the word restoration, to bring them back, to, respect, to restore them, to bring them back to where you was, to where they were. Other parts of scripture, the Bible talks about other people who have lost their first love. They no longer want to pray the way they used to pray. They no longer want to witness the way they used to witness. Everything has dropped. <laughs> Everything in their lives is characterized by drop. Dropping the level of prayer, dropping the level of being attracted to the things of God, having a desire to fellowship, a desire to read your Bible. Um, everything has dropped. Um, the giving has dropped. And there are all kinds of things that have happened in your life. They need encouragement. Okay. And lost the passion and the drive. People have lost the passion and the drive. Certain things have been taken away from them. They need encouragement. People whose life has lost meaning. Other people's lives have lost meaning one way or the other. Um, they've lost the meaning of why they need to do the good things they need to do. They're kind of like wandering in space and they don't know where they're going. They don't know what they're doing. They need encouragement. Um, that there are those who maybe have lost someone or, or one way or the other in a relationship with their life or maybe passed away and transitioned. They, they have the thinking that says, couldn't have done, could have imagined, couldn't have imagined life without you kind of a thing and people are facing that and say he's gone he's no longer here um whatever reason for whatever reason whether um within a relationship whatever whatever it is okay it, it, people look like they need encouragement things have gone their way but the the things have gone their own way but remember there's life after that and if the discouragement is taking its toll in your life this is what is um um is a is is designed to get you going now, it's a couple of things, an observation that uh, before I bring it, encouragement and bring it to you that we need to know as a principle. Number one, you need to get going even though things are tough. You need to get going. You can't just make sure you pack where things went wrong. You need to get going. There's mountains to scale. Um, there's years to conquer. There's, mount- there's a, a lot of things to do. There's businesses to start. There's children to raise. There's degrees to pass. There's new songs to write. There's, there's new businesses to start. There's new uh, performance um, um, uh, targets to be set. There's everything else to do. There's new job to find. So you need to get up and going. So you need to have the heart. Even though I've gone through discouragement or certain things have happened, but how do I get the going back? The, get, the going back. That's what we need to talk about. You need to get going. You need to get up. You need to put aside self-pity. Oh, me, it only happened to me. Why me, 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 me? Yeah, I understand all of that. And, I, and, the sweetheart, and my heart goes out to you. But you need to put aside the self-pity. You need to get down to the business of the day. And the business of the day, it says to you, it happened yesterday, you need to face your tomorrows. And so how you do that, how do you get around doing that? We need to show you how you need encouragement. And the, 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 one of the things that is very is striking, about the message of encouragement that I want to preach about is when you meet people who believe in you, when they tell you, you can do it. You can do it. You can get up and can do it. You can do it. You can do better. You can do more. You can do more. And while you're feeling down and, and, and the reality is hitting in your face and people who really know your capabilities and people who really, really know what you are capable of doing. I'm talking about the good things. And we can tell you straight, you can do it. And now you've got to make up your choice. Do I live in a street called the valley called discouragement? Or do I rise up to the level of my capabilities, what God has done, the deposits, the godly deposit in my life, that God has deposited in my life? I can do it. I can do that. Of course, scripture comes into it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm just laying the foundation. You can do it. You can do better. You can do it. You don't do better to prove anything. You do better to take yourself forward. 
You owe yourself to take yourself forward. Where there's a fall, there must be getting up. The Bible says even the Russians fall seven times, but we get up and do something about it. So you owe yourself to get up if there's been a falling down. And you can, you can make it. Other people can carry straight and say you can make it. While you know that you have, you have experienced the extreme failure, the extreme form of betrayal, the extreme form of disappoint, disappointment. And somebody walks into your life and says, I'm sent by God to tell you you can make it. And what do you do? Do you choose to sob the tears of yesterday or do you walk me from your face and face up to the fact that you can make it? So we want to look at things like that. What does scripture ever to say? And of course, God is a God of restoration. He needs to restore your, your will to fight. He needs to help you. So what I thought would be of benefit to you and I as a study of encouragement, of comfort, of strength, is to take one of the most decorated, colorful prophets of the Old Testament who went through discouragement and see how God helped me to get out of discouragement and to face the future and observe the principles that I've just dropped now that I've just told you about. And his name, guess whose name is? His name is Elijah. Okay, that, you remember that mighty prophet? That caused fire to fall from heaven and it bend, it bend the sacrifice. Oh my God, there's never something be done before like that in scripture. There's never anybody else that did something like that after him in scripture. He's the one who stands out, kind of like saying he's in a class by himself. He did the, uh, the miracles with a special. He was blessed with a special anointing. He was in a class of special prophets. What did he do? He rained fire. He prayed for fire to come down. And what did the fire do? It bend the stone. <gasps> Fire burned the stone. It burned the stone of the altar. It burned the sacrifice. It burned the wood. It burned the water around it. It burned everything. That's the strength of his prayer. That's how far deep the answer went. It burned everything. It burned to prove that God is alive. So he's a prophet of prayer. He's a prophet of strength. And what did he do after that? He proved it to the 450 prophets of Baal, the wrong prophets, that God is alive. After doing that, he's, he's beset. All of a sudden, the spirit of discouragement is coming upon him. After doing so much miracles, after doing so much for the kingdom, discouragement doesn't just come for people who are sitting by doing nothing. It comes to the best. And we need to deal with it. Take it. Take it on. Head on, as they say out there. So we're going to look at Kings number 19, chapter 19. And we're going to take our time and look at the principles on how we can get out. If you are attacked by discouragement, you were once a big preacher, a big woman of God, a big mom fundi, see? a big preacher's wife, a big preacher who used to live right and do the things. Now, 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 now you, when I visit you every day, if God would give me your eyes, there's always a bottle in front of you because you can't lift your head up. You can't do anything. I'm just, I'm just, you know what? I'm a preacher, so <laughs> I can say, <laughs> I'm not criticizing. So now there's all kinds of things in your life. And you don't want to hear anything about prayer. You don't want to hear anything about saints. You don't want to hear anything about Christians. You don't want to hear anything about it. You have been beaten by this thing. By this, you have been beaten by this thing called discouragement. It has taken the best, of, the, best, the best of you. But remember, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, I need to tell it to you. No, I've got to tell you this. I've got to tell you this. Hey, I've got to tell you this. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, if you fail in the day of adversity, your strength is little. The Bible says if you fail on your day of attack, your strength was little anyway. So in other words, even though you did great things, you never paid attention to the strength for you to survive. Should anything happen to you, have anything should hit you, you need to strengthen. So it's the day for us to pay attention to the amount of strength we think we have for God to strengthen us up so that we face anything we can pull through. We can make sure that we get stronger. We walk through it. We face up to it. You can, we, you warm up to the words of people who are going through difficult times and says you can do it. You can get out of it. You can make it. And you don't think people are insulting you. They're speaking into the inner recesses of your soul where God has placed his anointing and his power for you to come out and be strong and win and dance in the middle of your problems. That's what we're talking about. Of course, let's look at Elijah. So we're looking at Elijah in chapter, I nearly said in chapter Elijah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm enjoying myself. Oh, Holy Spirit, thank you for the sermon. Oh, I'm looking at the book of First Kings. There's no such a book called the book of Elijah, by the way, in the Bible. It's just that I'm enjoying myself. Praise God. Tell your neighbor, Pastor Anzo is right with it. Yeah, I'm, I'm right with it. I'm right, I'm right on the moment with it. It says in the book of First Kings, chapter 19, and Ahab told Jezebel, okay, those two important words are important. Those names, I beg your pardon, are very important. Those names are names of a husband and wife. Okay, so Ahab is the male, Jezebel is the female. Okay, you could have just, you could have guessed the name is longer, Jezebel, I'm joking. But he's a, he's a female, she's the wife. Okay, and Ahab 
by nationality is an Israelite. But Jezebel is a wife. She's a foreigner. Where she comes from, God was not honored. It's important for you to put in things in perspective. And, and historically, Jezebel comes from Ty and Sidon. Okay, Ty and Sidon is in Syria. Okay, and then Ahab is an Israelite who knows God of the Bible, the God of the covenant. Okay, let's put it further. So where Jezebel comes from, uh, the, 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 the God, okay? The, in other words, we call it in theology and Bible study, she comes from a polytheistic society. You know what I mean? Poly, anytime you see the word poly, which means pen, plenty, not only, not only polytheistic society. The word theis, theistic, which means come from, from the word theos, and the word theos in Greek and in Latin means God. So polytheistic society, which means where they serve many God at the same time, of course. Now, the particular division of the God they served where she comes from. There had to be a male God and a female God. That's where Jezebel comes from. That's what he sold to the nation of Israel. And let me break it down for you further. So the male God was called Baal. Baal. Baal, Baal, okay. And the female god was called Ashtera, okay. So Ashtera, and there's another name, a female name. I'm not going to get into it today, okay. So there was an Ashtera and there was a Baal, okay? who gods were broken down. So when they came into the nation of Israel, so there was a female god. The female god was when was depicted. If you go historically and look at some of the statues that are preserved today, academically, and of course. Um, for us to understand is a is a female god that believe in fertility is a god of fertility who brought who they believe he brought rain they brought they thought he brought rain for the rain to come that's going to be important in my text hang on my thought hold my thought right there so the fertility god is is called ashera so when ashera is around according to jezebel much rain is going to come much rain don't forget that which means when rain comes heavens are open but the god the true God of heaven says, not under my watch. I'm going to judge Ashtera, the God of rains. So what does Elijah do? The first great miracle he does, God gave him a power miracle to declare drought that rain does not come. When he says that, he then shows that Ashtera, the goddess that is believed by Jezebel, is a lie. So he starts breaking down. Oh my God, I love, I love Elijah. Elijah is a structured prophet. In the New Testament, he would be an apostle. He's a structured prophet who does things systematically. He's organized. So the first things he knows, he says, for you to control a country, for you to control a business, for you to control anything, start in the realm of the spirit. You can't control anything you have not broken down in the realm of the spirit. If you want to be big in business, if you want to be big in anything else that you do, you've got to have some keenness. You've got to have some ability. You've, as I say, they say it in business. You've got to have some capabilities uh, that know how to restructure the realm of the spirit. Uh, Jesus puts it differently. I love Jesus. Uh, Jesus, I love you too much for saying this. Uh, Jesus says, uh, how can you get into a strong man's house until you bind the strong man? Uh, Jesus says the way to get to the strong man's house, you've got to do something about the strong man. Uh, because when the strong are down, the weak shall be take care of themselves. Uh, and Jesus tells us when he spoke directly about the demon spirit, he bound in the man before he could heal the man. So Jesus says you've got to get your priorities right. Child of God, I know you want to win. Child of God, I know you want to control the business. You want to control certain business arenas. You want to control certain arenas at your work. You want to go into management. You want to be a director. You want certain jobs when you apply to be given to you. But my Bible tells me to tell you that the first thing you do before you can get higher, before you can get higher in position, you need to control the realm of the spirit there are forces that might be working against you in the spirit that if you ignore you're not going to get what you need and that is why the apostle paul says we're not fighting with flesh and blood we're fighting with principalities who are set up to oppose us who are set up to oppose the children of god you have been opposed in the realm of the spirit the people that are fighting you have been used by the realm of the spirit you will find out even no matter how much opposition you're facing in your life how many people come against you you'll find out the motivation comes in the spirit they are listening to the wrong spirit if you fight the wrong spirit, you will win the war. So that's what he does. Yeah. He first binds. He says, there's, no drought. there's not, there's not going to be rain for three years. He starts there. Therefore nullifying the power of Ashtera. Now, if he has dealt with a female God, he needs to deal with a male God, with a Baal. 
Then he finds 450 prophets. Because that's what he does, first of all. Then he finds 450 prophets of Baal. He says, well, let's test you if you can, if you can win in the realm of the spirit. Ask, he says, he puts a spiritual challenge first, not a natural challenge. He says, the God who answers by fire, which means the realm of the spirit, is the God. Whoever, who, if your God answers by fire, you kill me. You take me out. If my God's fire answers by fire, I take you out. Who answered by fire? The God of the Bible. And their God could not even answer one thing because he then controlled the realm of the spirit. Now, now for, now listen to this very carefully because the forces of darkness all know what they're dealing with. Jezebel realized that my hope is gone because her hope was to sell to the nation of Israel Ashera and Baal. No wonder then why Je, um, um, the prophet um, Elijah says to the children of Israel, you choose this day who you'll serve. He says you're faltering between two opinions. You don't know who you're going to serve. So then Jezebel recognized in, 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 in Elijah, I'm dealing with a heavy weight. Oh my God. Oh my God, I'm dealing with a heavy weight. Jezebel recognized, I'm not dealing with a small boy here in Elijah because I'm dealing with someone who can arrange things in the spirit and I've lost my hope because my gods have been rendered nullified. You've got to render some gods nullified. You've got to render them zero, some cause for you to win some more. Are you preaching, pastor? Yes, I'm preaching the Bible. My Bible tells me if I were to take the same thought further, I'm going to come back to talking about discouragement. I'm just laying the foundation. When I take this thought higher and further, it reminds me of David that when David was fighting with Goliath of course the Bible talks about how they came close to one another how David they tried to give him the weapon and the armor he refused and put it aside and said I will not wear that the Bible talks about how his brother tried to discourage him and said you are Papa why do you want you but he overlooked what those were close to him said in trying to minimize him because they were not celebrating him they were discouraging him watch those who are close to you who think they know you and minimize you at your moment of power and God says your people shall be willing in the day of your power when God gives you power certain things will happen to you but there'll be those who think you are just operating with everyday power and they can't see the moment power the kairos power may God give me the kairos the moment power to deal with things that are facing me at that time even though friends may say you can't do this but they fail to see the transaction has been done from heaven I've been given granted and endowed with moment power, Kairos power for me to deal with what I'm facing now. But this is the last part just before he could throw the stone. Listen to me very carefully. The Bible says the, 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 the giant, the giant, who the giant? Goliath. He cursed David with his gods. Oh my God, I love that. So shortly before the fight was ended, through David flinging a stone on his head and knocking him down. The last part becomes spiritual because David, under, because Goliath could understand. I, he can't, I can't keep him at bay. I can't keep him away with my words because he said all things, he called him a dog. He thought he would frown and run away like the rest of the the children of Israel. He called them dogs and they and they were afraid. They ran away. His words chased them away. And they were, now he finds out that in David, he can't use the same strategy of words. And David ran, but David keeps on coming. He's not running away. Then he realized, I need to shift gear. I need to use a serious gear because it looks like I'm, I'm dealing with a serious young man. I'm dealing with a serious 17 year old boy who won't take my words as a discouragement. I've got to call on God's God. He says, I curse you with my God. Even though he cursed David with his God. But David says, ye who I serve, I've got five stones, Jesus. He's bigger than your God. Because David knew, I've got to fight it in the realm of the spirit. And I'll win it in the natural realm. If you think you're going to win wars, Danzakai, sister, brother, if you think you're going to win businesses, not today in South Africa. You've got to have something bigger to offer than just trying to win. You've got to offer prayer. You've got to offer authority in the name of Jesus. You've got to claim it in the name of the spirit first. You've got to rearrange the set things that were arranged in the spirit before you came. You've got to say the right owner of this tender has arrived. In the name of Jesus, I shift things. So here, Elijah did that. And Jezebel recognized, I'm dealing with a heavy weight. I'm dealing with someone who knows the game, who knows where to start, who knows where it's won in the realm of the spirit. And this is what Ezra she did to try to kill him, to get back at him. Because you know, if I take out 
Elijah, I win back the nation of Israel. He says, my only stumbling block is this Christian that prays too much. Oh my God. Is this believer that believes in the name of Jesus too much. That fasts too much. That wakes up in the morning and saying, in the morning. That's the one that calls on in the spirit. So that when people call you and say hello, but you don't, you disregard phone. Because the Holy Spirit is busy with you. Because you, the Holy Spirit says, continue to pray. Control the realm of the spirit. So the, so the Jezebels of life, those that are follow, following other gods, they want to take you out. I know it's not a scarcity. I'm not scaring you. They know who knows the rules of the game and they want to start with those who knows the rules of the game. So then what did Jezebel do? He said, Ahab, it would be in our best interest to take out, take out Elijah, because he's our greatest problem, because his prayers are nullifying our plan. When we set out a plan and consult our God, he picks it up, he destroys it. We will never get far as long as Elijah is around. I pray for you to have a spirit of Elijah, so that the negativity, the wrong things don't continue when you are around. So that when the enemy plans, the Holy Spirit shows you in your sleep that there's a plan you need to pray away. You need to destroy in the name of Jesus. May you be that type of a Christian. Let's continue reading. We're talking about discouragement. Let's read chapter 19. And Ahab told Jezebel um, all that Elijah had done. Now, now, the man is reporting to his wife about all Elijah had done, the things that I've just told you. Also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a message to, Jezebel, to Elijah. Jezebel, remember? The one that knows Baal and Asherah. Why doesn't Ahab send a message man to man? Why is Ahab the man afraid of Elijah? Why is the, excuse my language, I don't mean to be sexist or, 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 or I don't mean to be stereotypical in my sermon and, and show that I'm backward in thinking. I'm not backward in thinking, I'm open-minded in thinking, but I just want to prove a point from scripture that is, de is depicted in the verses I've just read in the text. And the question that I have is this, why does Jezebel take it upon herself to send a messenger to, Je uh, to Elijah? Because she understands, he understands the game. If I take him out, I have my way. That's the rule of the game. Because you know too much. That's why you've got so many attacks in your life. That's why you pray too much. That's why when you stand too much in the word, when you do so much in the word, and the devil wants to make sure that he, 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 mess, he messes around with you. Okay, so let's read. It says, and then, then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods, can you see? She still believes in the gods. So that the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So he receives a message. He says, I'm going to make you a mean smith tomorrow. She sends a word. She sends a tweet, a Twitter. She sends it on Instagram with a facial expression there. She sends it on Facebook. She sends it on WhatsApp. She knows his number. She sends it by letter. She sends it by all methods of communication available at her disposal as a wife of a king in charge in royalty. She says by this time, she set the time. She's sure. She's sure of herself. By this time, I'll make you one of them. I'll make you mean smith. So he received these words. Now two things come into play. He either has to remember the power he was operating with or he has to stand or he has to be afraid and run. Get discouraged and run. We're talking about the discouragement of a man of God. Let's look at that very closely. Okay. The Bible says, so let the gods do to me, and I do not make your life as the life of one by tomorrow but this time. And when he saw that, when he saw it, he arose and ran for his life. Now, why doesn't the Bible say when he heard that? So when he saw it, which means it was written in black and white, he saw it. Whether it was maybe a letter, she made sure he gets it. She made sure he gets it. The Bible says he ran for his life. What did he do? He ran for his life. Kind of like saying he dropped his faith and believed in his ability to run. He got discouraged. And that's what we're talking about. He needed some kind of encouragement. He ran for his life. When was the last time when you heard difficult things and bad news, you ran for your life? You turned your back on the truth you knew, the truth that God taught you. And you opted to running away. You, you felt that running away is the better option than standing on your ground for what you believe. Because when you stand your ground, the Bible says, draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. God, you invite God into the situation. The Bible says, and when he saw, he arose 
and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. <laughs> he didn't even announce, <laughs> he didn't even announce to the servant. I mean, he's left his servant. He says he ran for his life. He, I mean, he, he picked up his feet and he ran. Running away, which means you're giving in to the problem. Running away, which means you're accepting the, the veracity, the truth of what you've heard, that you might, you might be true, you might get killed tomorrow. Running away, which means you accept that this is bigger than God. Ouch. This might be bigger than God. God, hold on a little bit. With everything good you have said, can I just use my sanity? Can I just run? When do you begin to run? Most of us have run away from prayer. Most of us have run away from praise. Most of us have run away from everything good. We have run away from giving. We have run away from praying. We have run away from doing the work of God, the things of God, because we've heard negative news about what's going on out there. We began to run. We began to thought. We began to run away, run away with, this, with our lives. Look at verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. Remember, I want to see God's attitude in the whole, in the whole setup. Okay, the, in the whole setup of, of Elijah running away. But he himself went a day's journey. Underline that word journey because I'm going to use it. A day's journey into the wilderness. And came and sat under a broom tree. And he prayed. Listen to the, his prayer. Oh my God. May I never pray this prayer in my life. I reject it. I rebuke it. May it never come to me. This is the type of prayer he prayed. And he prayed. Verse number four. And he prayed. That he might die and said. It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. So his prayer, listen to his prayers. So we know one thing he ran away, but we never know his inside, how he feels. For the first time, his inside is expressed in his prayer. He said, Lord, let me die. Take my life away. Kind of like if he could, he could commit suicide. How did he move from being the most powerful man to the man who's praying this kind of a prayer? Take my life. I don't deserve to live anymore. I'm not better than my father. And what, a, what, what, what did he do wrong? Nothing. He didn't do anything wrong. He just heard someone speaking Jezebel. Now, in the broader scheme of things, then, which means then Jezebel there was held in some kind of uh, esteem of sort. Because when she speaks, even a prophet gets under the table and runs away. And he causes him to pray this prayer. This prayer is not prayed by people who want to see a bright future tomorrow. This prayer is not prayed by people who believe in God for a new car tomorrow. Who are excited about tomorrow, about things that are going to happen. This prayer is not prayed by people who want to finish the job they started. This prayer is prayed by people who are discouraged, people who want to say, I don't want to live another day. I, want, I don't want to face another day. I just want to be out of this life. Take me! This prayer is not prayed by people who are, who are saying, who are, who are pro confessing Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans that we have about me, God. The plans to give me a bright future. This is not a bright future. This is a sad ending. This is a very disappointing ending for who? For the greatest prophet that we know. A prophet that is a cut above the rest. A special prophet. A prophet that could rain fire on stones and complete the, the stones. It says, I pray that I might die. I pray that we never pray that prayer. He's so discouraged and his life is so in trouble. Let's listen to God if he can listen to that kind of prayer. And I want you to listen to me very carefully today as I teach this part. Verse 5. Then as he lay and slept under a broom, Tree. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, and suddenly, now God is answering, because he has prayed, right? An angel touched him and said, arise and eat. Ow, ow, ow. Now God is moving. God is moving. He says, arise and, don't forget that word, eat, because I'm going to talk a lot about that eat. What do you eat when you're in trouble? It's very important. I'm not talking about the food that you eat. I'm talking about the spiritual diet. What do you live on? What do you listen to? What do you read? What do you meditate on when you're facing discouragement? What do you eat? Okay, let's fight. Let's, let's look at that. And the angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coal. Who baked it? Angels baked it. In the jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. He ate and drank. You're going to see those days when you're discouraged. The only thing you wake up to do is to eat and go back to bed again. That's what he does. He's so discouraged. He's, so, he's, he's got so much depression. He's, he's so much, his head is so heavy. He kind of like, why is his head so heavy? Why is he behaving like this? Because he heard bad news. Be careful of what you hear. And that's why the Bible says, take care of what you hear. He heard bad news that have shattered his dream, shattered his, his prophetic ministry, shattered everything he does, shattered his future, shattered his power, shattered his strength, shattered his influence. The Bible says he ate and he went back to sleep. 
Does the angel give up? Does God give up? He doesn't give up. Verse 7. And the angel that the Lord came back the second time, touched him and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. God says, I am not taking you. You are completing this. You can do it. You can make it. I'm not going to take you because you are discouraged. I'm going to tell you what I've placed in you. I'm going to remind you what I've done in your life. You can finish the journey. I've given you the food. I've given you the angels. Now get up and go. Get up and finish the work. God has sent me to you to let you know it's not time for him to take you. It's not time for you to allow you to sit by the waist by the side in ministry and never do ministry again and never pray again and never preach again and never give again and never uh, witness again and never love again god says the journey is too long that was just a lesson point get up and move god says says the journey is too long remember that journey word journey 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 I'm in a journey. My journey can't be defined by stops. One stop, no. That's just one stop in the journey. Journey. It would help you to know God has given you a journey. And remember, he decides how far you reach in the journey. All those that want to cut their journey short, they don't have heaven's blessings. Heaven sending his angel is to give you food, to give you strength, to give you pastors or today to preach to you, to tell you there's a lot of things you still need to win. There are a lot of, 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 of fights and, and wars that you still need to win and take over. There are a lot of things that need to come your way. You can't give up now. He has never brought you this far to leave you. He has brought you this far to help you and to be a blessing to you. Number one, so he says, there's a journey. And uh, verse 7, and the angel came back a second time and touched him. Arise and eat because the journey is too long. It's too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank. And he went in the strength of the food for 40 days. He went in the strength of something. So we tell, told you that exhortation means encouragement, strength, and comfort. The angel comforted him and he went in the strength. He strengthened. So how do we strengthen you? I want to make sure we strengthen. So we observe five things about Elijah. Number one. God restored the will to fight because it was a bigger fight than just Jezebel. God restored the will to fight. God says, get up and fight. The first part of your journey was to fight Jezebel and Ahab. They have bigger things to fight. So the first thing that God is going to do is going to restore the will to fight. Keep on fighting. Keep on fighting. He says, I will never accept that. I will never be defined by that. No matter what they say, I'm a child of God. Keep on fighting. Restore the will to fight. Number two, God brought the courage to face the challenge. You have what it takes. Number two, God brought back the courage to face the challenge. When he said, I want to die, what God says, get up and face it. Where you go, everybody knows what you did. They will be reminding you. They'll be telling Jezebel that we saw him. Face it. Face the challenge. Don't go away. Walk down that street where that, there's someone that disappointed you. Some people say, I wish if I could move to Cape Town, I could move to America. You're not moving anyway. Stay where you are and do the will of God. In the name of Jesus. Many people say that. Face the challenge. Three, God says to you, I trust you. I trust you because I called you and anointed you. I made you. I shaped you. I prepared you for this moment. I knew what would come your way. It was not for you to decide on my behalf, God says to you. Who are you to decide for me? I'm your God. I'm, you're going to do what I says. You're going to do what I say you should do. Like Elijah did what God says you should do. He says, get up and eat and go. Number four, getting strength back to finish what you started. God gave him strength back to finish what he started. The Bible says he walked in the strength of that food for 40 days. Who gave him the food? Who cooked the food? The angel God gave him. He continued the strength. God gave him strength to finish what he started. Every time when you feel you started, what you started is under attack you need to celebrate the unusual levels of God's provision. Every time when you feel what you started is under attack, you need to celebrate unusual levels of God's provision on your life. And God gave him the energy to keep on walking. God gave him the energy to keep on walking. As I close today, I want to give you a few verses to encourage you. I'm encouraging you today. Psalm, Isaiah 14 verse 3. I'm going to close with words of encouragement. Okay. It says, 
It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord gives you rest from your sorrow and from the fear and the hard bondage in which you were made to serve. God says, I should tell you, God is going to give you rest from your sorrows and from the fear that is driving your heart. But God is going to give you rest from Uval. How does he give you rest? He gives you strength. He gives you peace. He gives you joy. Receive the transaction of joy that's coming in your life. Second Kings 6 verse 16, so he said, do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. God has sent me to tell you, those are with you, the angels of God, God the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God himself. Those are with you are more than the ones that are with them. Those who are fighting you will never win because because when you're with God you've got the majority on your side. God says those are with you are more than those who are with them. Isaiah 35 verse 4 says say to those who are faithful fearful hearted be strong god says i should tell you those whose hearts are full of fear be strong do not fear i'm sent by god to tell you be strong and do not fear behold your god will come with vengeance with the recompense of god he will come and save you this is what it means those that have been fighting you you don't have to fight them back god will take care of it he will fight for you the battle is not yours but the battle is in the lord Revelation 1 17 says when I saw him I fell at his feet as dead but he laid his right hand on me saying do not be afraid I'm the first and the last God says I'm the last one I'm gonna have the last word on the fight I'm gonna last have the last word on your life you don't have to take away your life you don't have to be afraid and give up the call and give up the journey and give up the anointing God says I started it I'm gonna finish it I'm the Alpha I'm the Omega I'm the beginning I'm the ending everything i start in your life i knew it's gonna hit some turbulence i knew it's gonna hit some difficult times i knew some people are gonna be jealous i knew some people are gonna fight against you i knew some people are not gonna like it i knew some people are gonna take you out like jezebel wanted to take elijah out but lo and behold who had the last word who had the last laugh god jezebel's plan could not come to pass jezebel will could not be honored Jezebel's words could not come to true. Whose words came true? Whose will came to pass? Whose wing, whose plan prospered? God's will prospered in the life of Elijah. God's will, God's way, God's plan prospered. I'm here to prophesy over your life. The devil and the things that he's doing are not going to have the last word on your life. God's plan is going to have the last word. I rejoice because I'm not, not in the devil's hands. I'm in the hands of the Almighty God. He he called me, he chose me, he anointed me. He's gonna have the last words. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I've got the last word. I win. I've got the last words. I'm there for you in the name of Jesus. He says in Psalms 27:3, though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war would rise against me, in this I will be confident. He says, I'll be confident in this that God is with me. He says even though an army may surround me, even though an army can throw stones, even throw things at me, I will arise. I will not be afraid. I will sleep at night. I will praise Him. I will have peace. Somebody ought to give God praise. Somebody ought to give God glory. Glory! Glory! He's the winner. I'm encouraging you. Don't cut your life short. It's not the end as they sing don't bring the end before God brings the end it's not over until God says it's over let's sing in the name of Jesus
praise the Lord. I just want to encourage you when you've got enemies like Elijah had enemies. You go to 1 Chronicles 29 verse 11. It says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as heard over all. You are the head of everything. Nothing is your head. When I know you, I've got power of everything that is coming against me. And God says in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans and thoughts I have for you, says the Lord, plans for peace and well-being, and not for disaster, and to give you a future and a hope. God says the plans he has for you don't include a disaster. To take your life is a disaster. To quit ministry is a disaster. To leave everything and run away is a disaster. His plan for you include blessings, joy, increase. Enjoy and step out there and grab it and say it's mine. Peace is mine. Joy is mine. Prosperity, blessings are mine. As I leave you, as they sing, may you be blessed. Stand strong and be encouraged in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for observing and watching the services with us. I hope you have learned something new. If you want to write to us, please write us. But one thing you can't argue is that you've seen the hard work, the love, the care of the church that we've put into the services, into the telecast. Of course, don't forget to support us financially in any other way through prayer. And of course, our details and our banking details will be shown on the screen. Make sure that you outdo yourself. It's a good ground for you to sow and to support us. May God keep you. May his face shine upon you. May God be to you whatever you pray for. May all your, answer, your prayers be answered. May God be good to you to cover you when you're asleep, when you're driving, protect you. May you protect your job, your money, your mind, your children, and everything that you have. Keep what you have in Jesus' name. Amen.